And now, from the dark corners of the internet, where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the beer flows steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. This podcast sponsored by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit them on the web at www.sans.org to learn more. And by Tenable Network Security, the creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution at www.tenable.com. And by Black Squirrel, pen test networks from your browser, exploits the limits of network security through just a browser. Have a Chrome exploit in your toolkit? Good. But for the rest of us, there's Black Squirrel. Visit blacksquirrel.io for more information. Now it's time to fire up a packet capture, pour yourself an adult beverage of some variety, and give the intern control of your botnet, because here's your host, he's a man, wait, you're still a man, right? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Last well, I oh, right, the beard, that's, yeah, okay. That's right. Looks good on you. Thanks. Paul Asadorian! <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to this edition of Paul Security Weekly. This is episode 409 for Thursday, March 12th. 2015. Very excited to be here. We've got an interview. We've got some stories to talk about. We've got lots of people on the line who I will introduce first, then announcements, then our special guest. To my right, Mr. Larry Pesci. Yay! Finally back. <laughs> Finally back. And Jack is in the studio. So we've Larry and Jack both in studio. Cheers. Just, I don't know if the studio can handle that much sexiness all at once, uh, so you guys just tone, that's, it, that's, tone it down over there. That's why they have the blast shield over there on the engineering station. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's sexiness. We're going to have to get them shield. all red shirts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> on the lines via Skype, Mr. Carlos Perez. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, Paul. Hey. Mr. Joff Thayer from North Carolina. G'day, Paul. How are you? North I'm Carolina. That's wonderful. how we speak down here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and Mr. Michael Santar Canangelo. I always say your name wrong. You, almost, you know what? That's almost. My... I thought that you were going to wow. get it this week. No. <laughs> no. I, yeah, that, you, you know what? That that's. Gentle and then completely let down. There was only like one extra letter instead of an, another. Oh, word. Yes. I, just <laughs> all, that's, I'm going to just say it wrong every. Santa. Santar. Santar Cangelo. Santar Cangelo. Welcome to the show. Listen, when a I'm gonna when see a, how many times listen, I can get a wrong, Rhode Island times? Armenian is making fun of your name, perhaps wow. somebody should be handed a and mirror. You, and you, you and you'd think he should be able to pronounce it because it ends in a vowel. That's true. Yes. Mike, you're you're but wicked. Uh, you're all wicked awesome. Welcome to the show, Mike. Glad you're able to join us this evening. <laughs> All right, a couple of quick announcements before we get started. Cold weather got you down. Actually, it's starting to warm up here Barely. in Rhode Island a Barely. little bit. <laughs> Yesterday was warm anyway. Um, Ra- wa- wait, no, no. <laughs> what? <laughs> Only warm in comparison. Right? Well, like 40 degrees is warm yeah. to me. Hey, hey, I Carlos, was outside in shorts hey, hey, yesterday. Carlos, is 40 degrees yeah. Fahrenheit warm? <laughs> Just for reference. <laughs> a reference. <laughs> I took the Mini Koopa out for a ride yesterday. <laughs> yeah, you needed it because it's the only thing you can park in this darn parking lot. That's right. Uh, let's see. Warm up to embedded device security assessments. A two-day hosted class. Uh, not uh, No, it is a two-day class at Black Hat Las Vegas. That's right. Black Hat Las Vegas, August 1st through the 2nd and 3rd through the 4th. There's two offerings. Make sure you sign up. Do we have one of those routers? Can you give me one of those links? Routers? Routers? I need a router. I need a router. So I bought I bought uh, 20 of these. That's it? Bad boys. Yeah. I can, oh, I'm going to buy more. These came refurbished. They were $15. $15. These are Linksys E1200s, and we're going to be doing some very special it'd things. It would be awesome if they did a different camera to it, like, it, show it, that even it? more close up. Oh, it, there you go. Same. I see. Yeah, you perfect, can, perfect, perfect. 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 For, for those wondering, at so, the end of the show, we will uh, auction off the R's that Paul has not used in this show. <laughs> <laughs> I do that on purpose. 
I used one. Do I get one back if I yeah. no. I got to use an extra no. one? I got to no. see. We'll, we'll add an R. It's like yeah. vacation days. Use them or lose them. So I had this idea, and see, I put one back. Perfect. They don't get lost, Jack. They're just in a different they place. Re- <laughs> they just rearranged. <laughs> so we bought a bunch. I don't, of I don't even know how to say that letter. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we bought a bunch of these for class. We're going to be hacking firmware on them. There's going to be all kinds of fun things you're going to do with these, including um, we're going to put some trojanized firmware on here. You're going to have to figure out how we've backdoored the firmware. It's going to be a lot of fun. Make sure you sign up for our class at blackhatsecurityweekly.com forward slash IOT. Make sure you sign up today because it just gets more expensive the later you sign up. Also, you get lunch included with that and you get access to the Arsenal Talks and a whole bunch of other stuff at Black Hat. So make sure you do that. Larry's teaching Sands wireless ethical hacking and defense coming up in Orlando in April. And then in Austin, Texas, the end of May, or mid to end of May. Yep. Um, and then in Baltimore, Maryland in June. In Berlin, Germany in June. You're back to back. We, uh, you go right from Baltimore we, we to Berlin, Berlin, Germany. First tangent. You know there's a brand new tiki bar in Austin opened by the people that run the craft uh, cocktail bar in Austin. No. <laughs> Oh, it's going to be a rough week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. Or a good week, depending on how you look at it. Uh, Security I... Weekly listeners also receive 10% off all products in our store with the discount code IHACKNAKED. That's shop.securityweekly.com. Make sure you sign up for our mailing list. That's the Security Weekly Insider. Sign up for our mailing list because I sent an email out last week. I try not to spam the list too much, I promise. I sent an email out last week with like three things. And then at the bottom, I'm like, if you read this far... You got a 40% off discount code. So I tend to do things mm-hmm, like that. Mm-hmm. So you got to pay attention to our, ma- our mailing list. Our, uh, sorry, our um, subscriptions, email subscription. Our mailing list is separate. Anyway, I'm just rambling now. I want to introduce our very special guest for this evening who wowed us with her TED Talk. And we're like, we must get her on the show. Uh, Karen Elizari is with us, an international recognized cybersecurity expert. Since 2000, Karen has worked with leading Israeli security firms, government organizations, big four and Fortune 500 companies. She holds a CISSP certification and a bachelor's in history and philosophy and is currently a senior research fellow with the Tel Aviv University of Science. Security and technology. Security and technology. Thank you, Larry. Yes. I'm going to try and skip around because it's very long bio. And I was trying to yes. shorten it. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> Karen uh, works for G- Gigom? G- G- how do you Gigom? G- Gigom Media. Gigom mm-hmm. Media currently. Uh, and also, as I said, gave an awesome TED Talk that's been viewed by 1.4 million people and translated to more than 24 languages. And is, oh, was on the top 10 TED Talk. It's definitely my favorite TED Talk, hands down. Oh. Karen, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Paula. And I have to tell you, you pronounced my last name perfectly. I so pronounced well one thing correctly. That, that was the <laughs> one thing I wanted to pronounce. I was saving up all my pronunciation energy for your last name, Karen. Good, so, good choice. <laughs> good prioritization. Good yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Karen, how did you get your start in information security? So, uh, you know, it's interesting. It was information security back in the 90s. Now everybody's talking about cybersecurity. That's something maybe we'll talk about later because I think it's an interesting uh, change. But for me, it really began with this uh, fascination of taking things apart uh, playing with gadgets that we had lying around the house, crawling under tables, disconnecting cables, putting them back together in different places. I just always was that kind of girl, I guess, that was trying to poke around and was very curious and just tried to learn about, I guess, like I, I couldn't have secrets kept for me. Mm. I guess yeah. that, would be, <laughs> that would be the best way to describe it. And... Um, when I was about 13 or 14, I first got on IRC. And uh, that was very early for the internet in Israel. We only got like commercial internet in 1993. Um, I guess you guys probably had an internet connection earlier. But we got in 93. And I just, uh, like my first thing that I did on the internet was learn how to uh, write HTML and talk to hackers on IRC. That was basically my introduction to the World Wide Web and the internet. And I just got started there. Excellent. That was like 20 years ago, more. Gosh, I, you know, I, I feel like a veteran now. Uh, not, you know, not like you guys. It's so okay. A, a, You're not as old as Jack, and that's why yeah. we keep him around. It makes us all feel better. So sort of a little follow-on to that. When, when you were 
as as a child, you know, trying to figure out how all these things work and taking it apart. You know, was that something that was encouraged by family, or was it just something that was sort of self motivated? Oh, it, I was definitely self motivated. They couldn't keep me uh, away from those stuff, but. Um, uh, my dad is an electrical engineer, and he's kind of like an inventor. I like to think about him. He's kind of like Tony Stark, only without the billions and the Iron Man suit. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, small difference. But he's always, like, tinkering and making stuff. He's, he's into solar power. We had a solar kind of solar power station on, on the roof of our house. So we always have, like, stuff lying around, like radio antennas and, and gadgets. And whenever he would get, like, a new gadget... I would get all of the old legacy gadgets to play with. Those were kind of like my toys. So it was definitely encouraged. You could okay. Say. That's awesome. Excellent. That's awesome. It is pretty awesome. I, I very much, uh, you know, hold my parents dear for the way they let me uh, just do whatever I wanted. And they, they didn't hold back when I wanted to spend hours online, which is, I think, exceptional. I mean, in the 90s, where not a lot of people were actually online at all, at least not here in Israel. Karen, uh, you have a very uh, positive outlook on the, the word hacker, and we, we, we often don't talk about the meaning of the word hacker too much on the show, but I, I want you to give your take on, on the word hacker and what it means to you. Sure. So for me, uh, hacking really is about curiosity. It's about testing the limits of what is possible. It is, uh, in the words of Arthur C. Clarke, going beyond the limits of the possible into the impossible. And uh, I don't see hackers as, as bad guys, not necessarily. I see them as people that just always want to push those boundaries and try to find something else new, interesting, and exciting to do with technology. People that don't just accept things, um, you know, don't accept reality as read only, but try and change that attribute and um, manipulate <coughs> reality, if you will. It's a bit philosophical, I know. <laughs> No, no, that's, that's great. And, but in your TED Talk, you talk about why the world needs hackers. Why is that? Well, so many reasons. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the TED Talk, it's just 16 minutes, and uh, I couldn't really go into my whole thesis about uh, why I think hackers are important. But really, if you look at a lot of the, the technologies that we use, they wouldn't have been around at all if it wasn't for hackers and tinkerers and for people that were doing the impossible, what people thought was impossible. And so that's one reason why we need hackers, because they actually create new technologies or they find new uh, ways to use an existing technology. But the second reason is that hackers, good guys and bad guys, they force the world to notice the problems. They force us to take a look at the vulnerabilities. They force us to take a look at the failures, the design failures or the problems and technologies that we rely on. And by doing that, they are a part of uh, what I like to call the immune system of technology. They, are, they force this change. They make it happen. And, you know, sometimes, um, you know, the third reason why I think we need hackers in the world is that we live in an era where technology and access to information is, is a power. And it's a power that governments and corporates are, you know, conversant with. And so sometimes the only people that can stand up for the you know, little man are the hackers because they're the only ones that can also challenge governments and corporates when it comes to gathering massive amounts of information about everyone, for example. It, but, you know, that power can be abused as well. And it's interesting. Some people <laughs> ask me, too, they're like, oh, well, you know, you're in security and you do hacking. They're like, have you, have you ever been tempted to double your bank account or, or, or do those kinds uh -huh. of things? Uh-huh. Like, well, yeah, of course, yes. we've all been tempted, but... <laughs> Well, yeah. how, do, how do we keep a positive light on, on those activities and encourage people yeah. to go, not go to the dark side, so to speak? That's a very good question. And that's a question I've been uh, personally um, working on for a couple of years now. Uh, I really do feel it, it's all about choice. It's all about the choices that hackers make every day, every moment when they're faced with that option of, you know, do you use your knowledge and your skill sets to just make some more money or, you know, read your ex-girlfriend's email or something like that, or do you use it for a better or higher purpose? Uh, and there are, it, it, it's a big question. I'm always thinking about how can we encourage and foster those um, choices? You know, I, I, I try to avoid using the term the right choice because who am I to say what's the right choice? But um, I think it, would, it all comes down to a, a moral compass or a personal sense of... Uh, 
wanting to do the right thing for your own reasons, not because somebody says it's the right thing. And we have to kind of create that atmosphere. That's why I keep talking about hackers as good guys. You know, that's what I want to see in the world. I know it's very, you know, optimistic. Uh, some people call me naive. That's okay. No, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, but sometimes uh, hackers are trying to do the right thing, but mm. they're persecuted for it, right? When we talk about disclosure, <laughs> and as you said in your talk, and we've talked about it on the show before, yeah. you find mm. this vulnerability, the company won't listen to you, so mm -hmm. you make it public. But now you've just admitted to the world that you broke the law. So what are your kind of thoughts on those situations that even when we encourage people to do the right thing, sometimes there's That's consequences? Right. That's right. There are consequences. So one thing is that, you know, on the policy level, I think uh, there needs to be changes. In the, uh, for instance, in the United States, you have the Computer uh, Fraud and Abuse Act, and that's only – they're trying to make it even worse. And I've been writing about that. I wrote about that in Wired. I wrote something uh, in uh, Scientific American, which I hope will come out next month. I've been writing about that sort of approach as being just, you know, the complete opposite of what we need to get more people to fix vulnerabilities. Criminalizing security research is probably the last thing that the world needs right now. Uh, on on the personal level, well, obviously, guys don't don't get caught. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> that's some sage <laughs> advice, actually. We, well, I mean, if you want to do full disclosure, uh, which is that it is a questionable kind of uh, practice, uh, there are ways to do it without getting caught. Uh, I'm you know I'm not encouraging any criminal activity. Uh, but it, it is tricky. It is tricky to find that right balance. And that's another reason why I'm very excited about, um, like, mediators, like bug bounty programs, mm -hmm. and companies like HackerOne and BugCrowd, and I think also CrowdCurity. There's a bunch of companies now that are trying to mediate that relationship between the uh, hackers and the, the technology companies. And I think that's a great approach, actually. Jack, did you have a question? Sorry. I, I was just going to – she's pretty well covered, and she's written about this before, and, we, and we've talked about it. It's just that the, you know, the CFAA and similar laws around the world have um, the potential and the reality for some people of, of having a chilling effect, pushing research researchers outside of – outside of uh, where we normally live. Um, and once you criminalize what people do, yeah. you've created criminals. And it's uh, the flip side is that we've yet to define what really a security researcher means, what a, what a good guy hacker means. And there's a lot of gray, and we're trusting politicians who... Mm -hmm. I don't know that we can trust. But I mean, if we look at the CFAA, we go all the way back. The first conviction under the CFAA was arguably legit, but maybe the penalty was inappropriate, as it was uh, Robert T. Morris. Um, okay. Everyone, top to bottom, I think, knew then and understands now that that was non-malicious. Um, I don't know that it was a bright move. It got out of hand. You know, he did. He certainly did some damage. Um, that's and, the Morris worm, right? Yeah, the Morris worm. And, you know, and since then, uh, maybe he would have done even more if we'd been more lenient. He's, he's only done things like found Y Combinator and become a tenured professor at MIT and educate generations of MIT yeah, uh, graduates. But, no you know, I mean, just, other than that, so, you know, there's a case where I think if that happened today to somebody purely hypothetical, but, you know, CFAA, the way it's prosecuted today, uh, Robert Morris wouldn't have a career. Um, we would have deprived ourselves of um, a, an innovator, an entrepreneur, and an educator. And, um, and potentially all of the companies and all of the students that he went on to teach and to foster. And he's not the only one, by the way. Y Combinator, right. also uh, Paul Graham, I believe, the, the right. co-founder, uh, wrote extensively about the importance of hackers and hacker culture to the innovative edge of Silicon Valley and the technology industry in America. Uh, I, I absolutely agree, Jack. And, you know, uh, another way that I'm trying to pursue or push this message out into the world is by talking outside of the uh, so-called eco chamber. So I go to speak with companies, government agencies, organizations, really all across the board, uh, all over the world. Yeah, not just in Israel, not just the States. I've been to uh, Japan and Europe and, you know, a bunch of places. And my main message is, you know, hackers don't have to be the bad guys. It's up to their choice. Yeah, but it's also up to how we, we talk about hackers, how companies react to hackers when they try to make that disclosure happen. And I really feel we have to make that sort of change happen in all of those different ways. You know, making the industry realize that 
um, that hackers can do good things or make the general industries, not the security industries, so the, the other people that, you know, for them, hackers, all they're imagining is this guy, you know, with a... Uh-oh, she's going to do it. it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And it's convenient. That, uh, it's very convenient that it was right there. Yeah, that's right. Put on the hoodie, yeah. yeah. It's my late night hacking hoodie, right? And this is what people in tech can imagine, like, this kind of thing. And, you know, I really try and change that image that they have because, you know, when, when you guys come out to DEF CON or when you go to hacker cons around the world, you don't see a bunch of criminals, right? You see great guys and girls that are there teach, to learn, to share. I want to show the world that sort of view of the hacker world. Now, M Mike, you had some questions along the lines between the differences between uh, hacker and security researcher and in, in, in what that means. Yeah, I mean, you just asked the question. Nice oh, done. Okay. <laughs> and your pronunciation on that was fantastic. Well, you like that, huh? <laughs> my, that my late night, my late night hacking attire is a snuggie, and it, it's leopard. But anyway. Well, well it's, as long as it's not a unicorn onesie. Yeah. I think. <laughs> I don't, well, that, so secret, maybe, secretly it is, but yeah. no. <laughs> he's, he's trying to save a little I'm, face. Now I'm going to get one, though. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, wasn't that Dave? Uh. We, uh, we celebrated Pugin, which is a Jewish Halloween. It's a holiday where everybody dresses up. And you wouldn't believe how many unicorn onesies, uh, anonymous masks, and Batman were on the street. So what does that tell you about the state of the world? We're, you know, we're heading into a reality where everybody is secretly either a unicorn, uh, anonymous hacker, or they're a vigilante. Mm. That's the choice you have. You're or like a combination of all three. So, so, yes, so, exactly. Some <laughs> might argue that anonymous and vigilantes are a little bit one and the same. That's but. true. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, it's you know, different, different costumes, though. So yeah. was there a question? Uh, I, sorry, I yeah. so <laughs> the distinction between hacker and security re researcher, do we draw those lines? Are there lines between that? And what are the differences? Yeah. So uh, for me, part of what I try to do is kind of use those terms, sometimes uh, even synonymously, mm. uh, because I feel it's a good way to kind of shed more light on what hackers do, which is a form of research in many, many cases, right? Um, and it's also a good way to decriminalize, decriminalize the firm. And it's also a good way to get people to think about hackers in a different way. You know, that what they're doing is not just fun and games. It's not just tricks. Uh, it's not just, you know, I pushed a button, bang, something happened. There's a lot of work and thinking and expertise and trial and error that goes into hacking. Uh, and of course, you know, as the, I mean, I think traditionally a security researcher is somebody that, um, finds vulnerabilities or new vulnerabilities or somebody that does reverse engineering on malware, probably that would be the traditional definition or the narrow definition of a security researcher. But there's a lot more to do. There's a lot more security research to do. And I'm very comfortable with using the term interchange simply with, with hacker. Uh, when I'm speaking outside the security community and the hacker community, I feel that it's, uh, it's a good way to get people to think more positively about hackers. Mm -hmm. So do you think that bug bounty programs um, are, are a good thing, or do they, do they harm that field of security researcher? Wow, that's a good question. So I, I know uh, there are some researchers and some people that feel as though bug bounty programs, um, I don't know, kind of make what they do, uh, that ch cheapens what they do in, in some way. I'm not sure. Personally, I, I think that bug bounty programs overall are very good, are a very good uh, development. Um, there is some initial research, um, <laughs> initial papers, like academic data-based research that is showing that there are incredible values to bug bounty programs in the sense of the bugs that are being found have, uh, on average, higher severity than the ones that internal researchers within companies are finding. Uh, and it, it, it's bringing a lot of value to the companies that run the program. One thing that I really wanted to do this year, and I submitted this as a research paper proposal at Tel Aviv University, is to run a much more uh, detailed um, research at the values that bug bounty programs create, not just for companies, but also what are the values for the researchers that are participating in them. And I think, I can, intuitively, I feel that bug bounty programs are great. But I would like to do some research on it and, and base it on proper data mm -hmm. and not just you know, tell you what I feel about it. Um, 
Mike, did you have other questions? <laughs> I'm stealing your questions here. I'm sorry. No, man, run with them. You okay. sound really good when you ask them that way. But, but uh, you <laughs> know what? I, I, I do want to go back to a second, though, because uh, if, I, if I can roll back. When we talk about security researchers, one of the things that, that concerns me is that at least I would like to be able to hold somebody who considers himself a researcher to some sort of a standard. I'd like to have some way to identify what a researcher is or what they do, either by their methods or their their ethics or their canons. And I, I'm not searching for certification. Um, I'll leave that for Jack because I know how much he enjoys it uh, or government hey, intervention. Hey, hey, you're the alumni of that corporation. <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about, yeah, Jack. Nor but, do but I. The, but the point to it is, I, you know, I always look for these analogs and – you know, I like somebody who, who's a cancer researcher has certain things that they do. Somebody who is some other type of researcher. And so I keep looking for uh, some some way to to measure it so that when somebody comes along and does something really stupid and says, oh, but I'm a researcher, we can say, mm -hmm. no, uh, no, you're you're not. You're just a jerk. <laughs> so how do we do that? I mean, maybe that's, there's nicer words, but, but that's a very valid question. I I. I I think, you know, this whole certification and standardization thing, generally, generally it's a good thing. But if you look at the security industry as a whole, you'll see that there are so many different fields and aspects, right? And, and that's why there's, I think, so much uh, uh, pushback sometimes against certifications and standards. Maybe you guys feel the same way. That, that it, it would really be very difficult to kind of pigeonhole um, a certain field and say, okay, you're like a certified expert on that. Although I am a certified, you know, I'm at CISP, okay, a bunch of other people are. I don't know if that is really the best way to measure my uh, researchiness. No, that's not a word. <laughs> I, a word. Uh, the fact that I'm affiliated with an academic institution, I believe, makes me an, a researcher in that sense of the word. Um, how do you measure it when the researcher, or when somebody is a jerk? You know, when somebody's a jerk, then... They're just a jerk. I'm sorry. I don't have a very smart question. No, it, it's okay. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting there necessarily to be an answer. I just, you know, I, I always, I, I get a little tentative when people suggest that we're going to chill security research. I go, great, what's security research? How, how do we define it? Because we have to, at some level, we have to be able to define these things, and there has to be either a competency to it, a process. There has to be some hallmark, some way to identify research. Well, if well, and, and I, I and so. I actually want to make sure it doesn't require you to have a PhD and be affiliated with the university. I mean, that's that's one way I, to do it. But. I absolutely agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. You don't have to be affiliated with a university. Uh, the fact that I am, you know, is, is just my personal bio. I feel that there are a lot of people not affiliated with the university. Maybe a lot of people that don't even have a high school diploma. So what? The question is uh, if they're researching vulnerabilities, uh, if they're doing it for fun and profit, and uh, you know maybe the profit part is a bit of a problem if it's uh, profiteering in the sense of selling zero days for two hundred thousand dollars. I feel that is a jerky thing to do personally. Uh, uh, does it does it matter who you sell them to? No, but, it, <laughs> but you know in that case, in that case in a lot of other cases the internet somewhat polices itself. And I forget what vulnerability I was looking at. But it, I think it was some kind of authentication bypass or something ridiculous. And someone said, you know, someone actually tried to sell this to me for $3,000. And I'm just going to disclose it because I think it's ridiculous that they could uh, offer that amount of money. So at what, at what you touched on this in your TED Talk, uh, Karen. <laughs> at, at what point does the Internet police itself and how does that tie into, you know, hackers and being ethical or yeah. unethical for that matter? Yeah. So I, I wouldn't use the term police at all here. Uh, I would say that... It, the internet and, you know, in the wider sense, um, the cybernetic reality that we live in, which is broader than just the internet, uh, it definitely has vulnerabilities and problems and it has jerks and it has trolls and it has a bunch of bad problems, you know, kind of built into it. And it's going to have those in the future. And so in my opinion, the only way, the only possible way to get uh, um, rid of some of these problems is by having that sort of distributed uh distributed in the sense of not centralized, distributed community uh, of people that are uh, vigilant, as it were. And that those people, in many, many ways, by the way, you asked about policing. I don't uh, think of these police, but in many, many ways, you know, you'll see a lot of times where anonymous, for example, you know, they point out the, the trolls and the bad stuff. Sometimes they're trolls themselves, it's true. But uh, when they go against child porn, when they go against, uh, you know, like... Um, 
what do you call it? White white pride, nationalism, Ra- racism, when, or, yeah, yeah. racism, Church yeah, of Scientology. Oh, yeah, wait, well, yeah. They, you know, they kind of started with technology, and uh, there's a fantastic researcher, uh, Professor Gabrielle Coleman, she wrote a book about uh, Anonymous, and she says Scientology is kind of the anti-anonymous, in the sense that it, this, it's a cent- Scientology is a centralized, uh, you know, hierarchy, very um, kind of confidential, very exclusive organization with kind of sciencey, geeky ideas, and Anonymous is a completely distributed, dis- mm-hmm. uh, you know, loose, uh, it's not even an organization, it's, it doesn't have a hierarchy, but it does all have those kind of geeky um, values at heart, so it's almost the antithesis of Scientology hmm. in a way. But uh, since then, obviously, Anonymous has evolved a lot, and it's a bunch of different things. Last week, I heard that they are uh, declaring war on uh, ISIS, on the Islamic uh, State group. And, which... and Kanye West, are they declaring war on Kanye West as well, or is that just a rumor? They should. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't hear that, too. Oh, it's a way to get okay. people behind him, isn't it? Uh, well, yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there, Anonymous, if you're listening, if you want to get behind the whole Kanye West thing. I'm not opposed. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, the, the, to go back to the question, I don't think it's, it should be about policing. It should be... I, that's why I use the immune system analogy. We're all a part of this world, and it, it's a world that has uh, uh, bugs and problems and jerks and crime and a bunch of different things, and guess what? You know, governments are not going to solve that. Police agencies are not going to solve that. Not on their own. And uh, that's where I, I see hackers coming into the picture as the heroes. Again, adorably naive, I know. But that's my point of view. Well, no, I liked it. Being a hacker, I'm like, that makes us all heroes. I mean, that was the big takeaway from your talk was we should encourage hackers to be heroes. Um, do you yeah, mind if I ask, ask a question, Paul? Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Okay. Just thought I'd politely interrupt. Um, uh, Karen, that, that's how you pronounce your name correctly? Yes, Karen. Yeah. That's right. Yes, Karen. Um, uh, what, what is your sense, uh, and this might be a little bit of a, a United States-centric um, question, but, but I'd like to hear your opinion. What, what is your sense of how the media portrayal of, of hackers um, has um, damaged the security community? Mm. Well, you know... Uh, uh, the first thing that I got to say is that originally, at least for me, in the 90s, media portrayal of hackers uh, created hackers because I was encouraged to become a hacker by watching Angelina Jolie in the movie Hacker. And I'm pretty sure a bunch of other hackers started after that movie, uh, you know, themselves, 1995, uh, 20 years ago, if you can believe it. Uh, but since then, it's gone pretty much downhill and uh, we didn't get to see a lot of those hacker heroes in the media. Uh, I feel like that's maybe changing a little bit recently. There's um, a bunch of new shows and movies that are trying to make uh, the hackers the heroes. Of course, they always fail miserably when it comes to the like the rea- realistic technological aspects of it, right? And so everybody likes to say, "Oh, they're not using Nmap correctly," uh, which you know might be a valid point. But uh, to me, if if the I, I try to, to counter that all the time. I feel that it, it, the media can damage what hackers think about themselves and what the world thinks about hackers. And I really try to counter that all the time. I speak to a lot of media um, outlets and I, I write a lot. And I just kind of, if we want to have a different image about hackers, we have to create it. We have to be there. We have to show them the good stuff, the good stories, the, the cases where hackers are, are, are the heroes. And, and well, you know, it, it's not going to help sitting around on a, on a podcast saying, well, the media is portraying us as the bad guys. Let's go out. and You know, what's really what, what's interesting is that happened recently. There was a, a it wasn't front page Wall Street Journal. It was either like personal journal or weekend journal or something to that effect. But it actually specifically said hackers build a better insulin pump or something to that effect. And it was a little different than the way that our talks tend to go at places like Black Hat and DEF CON. But it was talking about parents that have children that are reliant on these uh, these insulin pumps. And they can communicate with Bluetooth to be able to monitor it. And so they essentially hacked the devices. That's exactly the word that it used to be able to better monitor their children, to give them better care, all sorts of stuff. And it was it was... I mean, in terms of column inches, it, it was a lot, and it was actually lauding how people can come together and figure these types of things out. And, and it stood out to me because it was the first time I saw the word hacker in a really positive light. 
Yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, maybe that is a little bit different, I have to say. Also, here in Israel, I guess we have a different, um, a different social atmosphere towards hacking. It's almost never used as a bad term. Almost never. Even when somebody is, is caught, even in the, I don't know if you guys even remember this. Uh, anyone remember Solar Sunrise? Mm -hmm. Remember that? Mm -hmm. a so Solar Sunrise, that was big uh, DOD, Pentagon said they had a huge uh, cyber attack, a terrible breach. I think it was around the time of probably the second Gulf War or Operation Desert Storm, something like that. And it turned out to be an Israeli hacker, a guy called The Analyzer, or he called himself The Analyzer. And he was working with a bunch of kids from the U.S. And, you know, it got into the press. And the guy uh, ended up serving some time in Israeli prison, maybe like a, a lot of time. Uh, but in a way, they still didn't, didn't make him into like a terrible bad guy. They were like, ha, 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 clever Israeli hacker outsmarts the American DOD. You know, even got like a, I think the prime minister visited him or something like that. It was kind of weird. So it, it's a pretty different um, national attitude towards hacking. I guess in a way we're a bit of a, a, a nation of tricksters or, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of technology innovation happening. And a lot of the startups, a lot of people that are creating new technologies are essentially hackers. And so it's a, it's a national yeah. product even. So I have one follow-on question, and that is um, you seem to be doing a, a very good job of promoting um, the security researcher slash hacker as, as a positive image, which we're really, really excited about, um, all of us, I think, in the community. But how do you think we can help ourselves generally to, to bring that message forward? What would, you, what would you like to see the rest of the community do? Yeah, uh, so fantastic question. I tried to do that with my recent uh, DEF CON talk. So this summer, I, I mean, the past summer, uh, in August 2014, DEFCON 22, I kind of gave a talk, uh, which is the opposite side of my TED Talk. If my TED Talk was for the larger audience, you know, here's why hackers can be the good guys. When I came out to DEFCON, my goal was to talk to the hackers and tell them, here are the things that you can all do. And these are things like participating in in disclosure, uh, when it comes to bug bounty programs or other forms of disclosure, these are things like looking at new technologies that need hackers to look at them, not just, you know, websites and, and HTML or Java or PHP or, but, you know, like insulin pumps and cars and homes. And these are areas that some, ha you know, uh, some great fantastic groups like uh, uh, the Cavalry guys and the Build It Securely guys and uh, the insulin pump hackers, you know, people are looking at it and they need us. I mean, the world needs us to look at these new technologies because those companies that make them sure as hell aren't looking at security. So nobody else is going to be, you know, testing those boundaries. Uh, and uh, we can empower the people that we work with, uh, which are not security professionals. We can empower them to think like hackers do and be more resilient. There are a lot of things that I, I think hackers and security researchers can do. And they don't have to go out on stages or on the media and talk about it or write about it like I do. They can just, you know, do what they do. They can hack and they can do security research, but they can make a positive uh, change in the world. And uh, I can send you guys a link to the um, talk at DEF CON if you guys want to watch that. It's a bit longer than 10. It's about 45 minutes. Uh, but there is some uh, great single mouth whiskey in the middle because, as you know, when it's your first time speaking at DEF CON, you get a yeah. visit from the goon squad oh, yeah. with, with whiskey. If it's your first time at death, speaking at DEF CON, you must drink. That was my first time. You know, I had to speak at TED where I got to DEF CON. Wait, you, you're only good. supposed to drink your first time at DEF CON? Oh, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> Did you break the okay. rules, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still apologizing for the second PCI panel. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Some of you know why. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Karen, uh, your uh, day job is, is somewhat interesting. Yeah. So you're working on multiple uh, different research I projects. A, I have, yeah, I have a bunch of day jobs. So one thing is that I do is that I'm an industry analyst with Gigam Research, and that's kind of like a, a Forrester, Gartner, 451 kind of industry analyst thing where I look at new technologies uh, things like active defense. I actually wrote about Paul's ADHD active defense uh, framework uh, recently. I also write for Wired, uh, for the European edition of Wired. Uh, I write occasionally for publications like Scientific American, like other publications about security trends, about what 
what is happening in cybersecurity that affects the larger world, I guess. I am a researcher at Tel Aviv University, and in that capacity, I do uh, security research mostly on things like, for instance, now I'm working on what is the impact and the value of bug bounty programs, which mm -hmm. is something I'm very passionate about, uh, trying to find that research that shows it. Not just say, you know, we think that bug bounties are great, but actually show the research that supports it. I am on the board of a couple of uh, stealth stage cybersecurity startups. So that is something I'm very, very excited about, uh, working on some innovative um, malware prevention stuff. Uh, I can't say anything more because mm -hmm. it's a bit, it's stealthy yet. Uh, what else? Uh, gosh, I, I just do a bunch of things. Oh yeah, Singularity University. I, I'm also on, I was a faculty member at Singularity University, which is a private think tank in, uh, in California. And I am often back to speak there about the future of security challenges. Cool. So, so uh, do you get over, do you get over to the states often for conferences, or just usually the major ones like DEF CON? Or yeah, I uh, I'm definitely usually at, I mean DEF CON. Uh, I will probably be at RSA conference next month. Uh, if any of you guys just see me, you know, just sat, come come say hello. Don't be shy. I'm very friendly and accessible. Uh, I'm going to be speaking in Canada next month as well, Atlantic Security Conference in Nova Scotia. Uh, some tickets still left for that uh, if you're in the Atlantic part of the world. Uh, what, is your, what is your talk uh, going to be on? What topic? Uh, it is going to be about the future of cybersecurity, how we can make that difference, how we can save the world, as it were, uh, the practical things that security professionals can do. And, and what, are, what are some of the biggest problems that I see in cybersecurity right now and how I think uh, security professionals and hackers can solve them? Mm. Very cool. Well, I won't ask you questions about that. I'll save it for your talk. So I'll have to okay. go, go to your uh, talk. Well, last thing, uh, talking about RSA, actually my talk at RSA is a crowdsourced session. Uh, so if you want it to happen, I need you to go and vote for it, please. On the RSA conference website, I can send you guys the yes. link to it. Send us the link. We'll tweet it out to all of our followers. Uh, I decided that I'm going to let the crowd decide uh, what's, you know, if, if the session is going to happen and what's going to be uh, the focus of the session. Oh, that's cool. That's yep. awesome. Does anyone else have any questions for Karen? No. Karen, <laughs> no, I mean, we could we could chat for a very long time, but we I think could. this was this was very good. Uh, yes, I enjoyed I'm that. I'm still talkative, which is you know good since uh, I now make a living talking. So. It makes my job easier as the interviewer person, yeah, it's, certainly. It's, it's hard to get me to shut up. Sorry, guys. No, no, no. It was great. Uh, so we have uh, five ridiculous questions for you. Are you ready? Okay. Shoot. Three words to describe yourself. Geek pride, cyberpunk, party monster. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Aha. Uh -huh. uh, I would go with a killer drone. Mm -hmm, nice. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Um, I would say Vermilion, which is a very specific type of red. It's uh, the type of color red that I have in my hair. It's a dark kind of feisty red. Cool. If you could have superpowers, what would they be? Haha! -ha, wow, that's a good one. I would definitely say flying. I think flying is, is the awesome superpower of all. Yeah, it would save time in an airplane, certainly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really convenient when you have to like be in three different the continents seats. in a, in a, and in a month. And the seats are way more comfortable. Way more comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so the last one is choose two celebrities to be your parents. Alive or dead. Okay, so in, I'm, I'm going to uh, try and honor uh, Leonard Dimoy, and I would like to choose Dr. Spock, if that's possible. Absolutely. And, and uh, I would like to pair him with Linda Carter, uh, or oh. rather, you oh. good choice. Very nice. Very, Very nice. nice. And I also, you know, it's kind of like a comic book kind of thing. What would happen if a half Vulcan, half human mated with a, a Amazonian warrior princess? You know, what would be the result? I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> Now you got me thinking. No, someone <laughs> needs to start up a research project. <laughs> First, find Vulcan. <laughs> yeah. Well, Karen, thank you very much for coming on Security Weekly. It was a pleasure having you. Uh, best of luck. I won't be at RSA. I will be at DEF CON, so hopefully we can, we can meet then.
Sure. And B-side. There's also B-side. Yes. B -side. Actually, I am going to, for the first time, I think, I, if the stars align, I'll be at B-side's Las Vegas this year. No, you won't. <laughs> yeah, believe it when yes, you see yes, it. Wait, you know what? All of us that go to the, all of us here that go to Vegas this August mm -hmm. will meet at Frankie's. Anything else is tangential. This is true. To going it, to Frankie's, it's completely true. irrelevant. <laughs> yeah. Well, Karen, again, thank you very much for appearing on the show. Yeah, nice thank to meet you, you guys. Karen. Take care. Thank thank you. You. With that, we're going to take a short break. Come back and talk about the stories for this week. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere.